Hello Marv, this is James Court from the Court Case Podcast and I just wanted to weigh in on uh, this Spider-Man chat that you're having. Basically, I was about, I was born in 1995, so I was about seven years old, six, seven years old when the original Spider-Man movie came out with Tobey Maguire and so, you know, when you're a young kid and you watch movies, most of the time, whatever the movie is, you just think it's amazing. But And it was the same with Spider-Man. I remember going there, I'd never seen or heard really of any other superhero before. He was the first one. And I just remember going into that film and just being absolutely blown away by it. Just the visuals, the storytelling, just the characters, everything was so, so good. And I've watched it multiple times a few years later. Spider-Man 2... The Tobey Maguire one is my favourite Spider-Man movie ever. I think it's one of the best superhero movies ever. And Spider-Man 1 was just a perfect origin story for that character. Another thing is the costume. The costume is fantastic. Like, it's the best Spider-Man costume they've had. It's so striking. It's so original. It's also... It's a little bit gritty as well. Like, the harsh lines and the, like, popping out sort of webs on it. And um, it's just an incredible film. And uh, I think a lot of superheroes these days, uh, superhero movies, they don't live up to it, in my personal opinion. S- especially the first two. It has that sort of campiness as well to it that's sort of comic booky that they've captured. I love it. Just a couple of my little thoughts on Spider-Man. I hope you guys have a great rest of the discussion about it. Uh, and I'll chat to you soon, Marv. Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Crabell, known to my friends as Marv. And this time, as a special bonus for everybody, I'm chatting with a group of podcasters who are, uh, let's say, among my favourite podcast hosts ever. So first of all... Oh, that's nice. That's right. First of all, I'll get more shit. I've, I've been nervous about this all day. Don't put me off that. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'm going to introduce from uh, one of the co-hosts of Real Blend, who's also the managing editor of Cinema Blend and the author of the book Release the Snyder Cut, which is obviously about releasing the Snyder Cut and the story behind those films, and also the author of the forthcoming book With Great Power, and I think we can guess what that book's about as well, hopefully, and that's (laughs) Sean O'Connell. Hey, Sean. Hello, Marv. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. Long time no see. I know. Good to, good to be on. I appreciate you inviting me over to this discussion. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, thank you for suggesting it. As soon as you suggested it, I thought, yep, yeah, I've got to do this. Absolutely. Also with me uh, today, I've got uh, from Comic Book Nation, that podcast, Comic Book Nation, and from the company Comic Book, who... Um, oh, do I say that you're affiliated with Paramount Television, Matt? Matt Aguilar? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, we're in the CBS family. <laughs> we're in there somewhere. <laughs> that's that's loose enough. It's all right. Well, the show is shown on Paramount Plus on Sundays in the US, I believe. That's right. Yeah, Sundays, baby. There you go. I do listen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will tell Kofi that uh, all his outros and intros are very much appreciated. He's so good at that stuff. Yes, and I'm looking forward to uh, my suggestion coming true this Christmas when you all <laughs> at uh, Comic Book do uh, do a Christmas song together, apparently. Uh, I will try my best to make it happen. I got a Christmas <laughs> hat somewhere around here already. It's time. It's almost time. We're only... I can't do math. No. Nope. Uh, we're only... <laughs> we're not that far. We're not that far. <laughs> we're not that far away from Christmas. <laughs> no, for, the, for, for to, just to put across what I mean, what, where this comes from is that... Um, from day one of listening to Comic Book Nation, I keep uh, putting out there every time that Matt or Janelle or Kofi or any of the hosts of Comic Book Nation suddenly burst out into song. And there's a tag going on t- on Twitter and all the socials saying Comic Book Nation's got talent. So- My choir teacher would be quite proud. All these years later, I'm making <laughs> it happen in the geek universe. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Got to keep it going. <laughs> And also from the podcast Stew World Order is Rob Stewart. Hey, Rob, how are you doing? 
I am doing well, Marv. Thank you so much for having me. And I apparently am being joined right now by my cat. So he has <laughs> he is saddled up next to me. He's going to help me talk about Spider Man. Wow, you told us told everyone what we're doing now. And <laughs> lastly, but not least, is Morgan Doherty from Docast, and I'm trying to remember the name of the true crime podcast as well. Mox. Oh yeah, uh, the Untitled Chronicles. So uh, we'll be bringing both back soon. So that'll be good. And I'm super excited to be here with you guys. Absolutely right. Now, d- did you all see the exhaustive research that I did the other day that doesn't even get anywhere near the exhaustive research that Sean had to do for his book? <laughs> I was impressed. It's a good outline. <laughs> Very good outline. <laughs> I cut it down to the bare minimum instead. Sure. Okay. That that would only take about a week to get through. <laughs> yes. So. We are talking about the 20th anniversary, and most of us can't believe that it is 20 years since the first Sam Raimi-directed Spider-Man film that starred Tobey Maguire. And, uh, oh God, 20 years. Actually, before I go through all this, Sean, what's your first memory of this film? Uh, I I was actually really dating myself. reviewing films for official publications uh, at that point. So I got to see a press screening of it and, you know, in hindsight, probably lament that that's my first experience of it, you know, because when you think about getting the opportunity to go opening weekend uh, and experience it with a crowd uh, probably would have been outstanding. And I didn't, I didn't go open weekend. I ended up going during the, during the week that it opened. So I saw it early and I, I got a chance to, you know, come back and write the review for it. And I'll never forget, like it's, when you see your favorite character come to life on screen and come to life the way that, that, that he did, uh, you know, you go in with, with, with moderate expectations, tempered expectations. Uh, and, and then you realize that, that it's a perfect marriage of, of filmmaker and, and story, you know, and to, and to see all of the elements of his origin come to life from the, you know, the wrestling match and the, the death of uncle Ben for the first time, you know, yes, it's yeah. been out, it's been played at this point now, but um, you know, seeing it all, seeing it all really come to fruition was, was remarkable. So um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you say 20 years, but it honestly, in all honesty, feels like it was about two months ago. It really does. What about you, Matt? Well, um, I'll say that, you know, I don't, I don't know if Sean was missing anything because I saw it opening week, but because I was going to college at the time, I couldn't go like, a, I went like during the day, Cause like we were going to full sales. So like we had a 24 kind of hour weird schedule. So like I went at like, you know, 1130 in the morning, like no one's, it's just me and like 10 people, you know, and even though it's opening week and I saw it by myself because I couldn't, all my friends were busy. <laughs> and so I was like, screw it. I want to see this movie. So I went and saw it by myself. And I remember just, I mean, much to what, you know, he said, I, I thought he put it great is that it's just seeing this, that like, this is possible. You've seen things like this attempted, with other characters, Captain America, other things, right? And there were things to love about those, but this was when you really saw like, hey, they can actually put money into this and make these scenes from the comics. Like, I remember just leaving and going like, I can't believe I saw him web swing. Like, I remember just leaving the theater like that. Like, I I can't believe I saw him just like shouting, especially like that scene where like he's swinging away from MJ and he's just like so excited to be swinging. Like that scene stuck with me. Stuff like that, the exuberance of that character that you've loved. Uh, for so many years so that that was the me. sound of the web sling the, the sound of the web coming so out good. too it, that like prior to that was ex, was wolverine's claws you know the first time i heard wolverine's claws pop and, and i was like god they got it how do they get it you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> little things like that that just make you appreciate the effort that went into it we're going off on a tangent i mean you you you've pulled a good one out there with the first the first x-men film that one was a surprise as well when that came out because that that succeeded expectations as well. Well, sure it did. And you know, this goes back to the, the people who were starting to make comic book movies around this time uh had connections to Marvel and were licensing these characters out, but but fighting a little bit harder uh to make accurate uh, adaptations, as accurate as they could be. You know, there are actually still notes and changes coming from studio heads that that feared, you know, making them too drastically comic booky because comic book had a different definition at that point 20 years ago uh but you know now we know that there was an, a, a a lowly assistant on the set of brian singer's film uh who who had a real eye for the way comic book movies should be told 
uh, and and his name is Kevin Feige, and and look what he's done since that point. Absolutely. What's your first memory of the this first Spider Man film, Rob? Uh, I remember seeing it opening weekend. I also think I saw it by myself. Self, I just kind of went and saw it. And then I think a few days later, I went with two friends of mine and we were big wrestling fans, like all throughout the nineties, every Monday night, we would get together. We would watch wrestling together Sunday night. We'd watch the pay-per-views because my parents got me like a black box for <laughs> sometimes <laughs> so I could watch the, the D scrambled pay-per-views. And then I just remember we watched the movie. We enjoyed it. And the entire like 45 minute drive home, it was just us going like bone saw <laughs> just the entire time, just <laughs> enraptured by that scene. <laughs> <laughs> Dear me, so many great things. What about you, Morgs? <laughs> yeah, so obviously uh, in 2002, when the film came out, I would have only been three at the time. So I remember, oh. um, yeah, so <laughs> young, <laughs> too young. But yeah, um, I remember watching it on VHS like a couple of years later. And it was like a really cool, like red VHS case. So it was like yep. went with the Spider Man theme. And I remember when I first put it in, it was kind of like right at the end of the movie. So I saw, obviously, spoiler alert, I know it's like, it's like a 20-year-old movie, but um, the Green Goblin scene, you know, the bit with the whether he dies at the end. So it was ruined for me straight away. But I still rewound it and enjoyed it at the end. Yep, I think the I think they did a really good job there. I mean, the, the casting was impeccable for that, you know. I mean, you, you've got some, you've got, I mean, it's a bit like, it's similar to what Feige's brought into the MCU now where, you've got top class actors in there and crew behind them and everything. And you can see the money there on the screen and they've really given you a top rate um, piece of product there. Cause I know uh, Sean, Sean will remember, I'm sure, you know, when we were younger, we remember the films and the seat and the, the, the very short series that, uh, that they made in the late seventies, you know, which is completely different but there was still something about that that was sort of like, because I, I'm like, sure, my my hero was Spider-Man and always was from the beginning. So anything that came that was Spider-Man, I'd automatically feel attached to watching that anyway. But but then it's like a whole nother level when they were making films like this to what they were making when we were younger. Mm-hmm. For sure. And, you know, the fact that they get someone of Willem Dafoe's caliber you know, to, to take on a villain role, which in, in all honesty, I, I believe that Defoe probably gives his best Norman Osborn performance in no way home yeah. uh, because he, you know, has evolved as the character. Uh, he, he is truly menacing in, in no way home in a way that I don't think he quite achieves uh, in the Raimi films. There's still a, a little, I don't know if I want to call it camp necessarily. Oh, no, it's camp. Uh, you could, he's a better actor. Can, kind of, yeah, can I? Can I call it camp? Okay, okay, that's fine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but he's also just a better actor. He's a better actor two decades right. later. Um, and I, you know, the, his transition, not to jump to No Way Home, but, you know, the Norman's on sabbatical, honey, is like, I get goosebumps, you know, just at his delivery yeah, with that. So, so God bless, you know, that casting, which allows, it, it opens the door to get someone like Molina you know, yeah. and then and then leads to a lot of these studios and these franchises realizing, oh, we can actually cast, you know, real actors in these things. And and, and then the real actors started to realize, oh, we can make a lot of money if we take these roles. And, you know, they didn't come with a, a stigma yeah. anymore. They were legitimate characters. I think for the actors, though, there's also a case of them watching these and then realizing that um, suddenly it's not like because back then they might have had this image of superhero films and superhero properties that way being like the old Batman series from the late sixties. And that there was that really high level of camp or it wasn't quite, it didn't quite have the money behind it. Like those, you know, the captain America's from that they tried to make back when, and these other films. And suddenly when they saw a film like this first Spider-Man and before it, the other films as well that we mentioned, that it was like, hold on a minute, this is actually quite serious and there is something here. So that was attractive to the actors as well, to be able to play something that had a bit more uh, gravitas to it. Well, it was interesting because by the time this had come out, you had kind of gotten three 
different flavors to show how it would work. You got something that was pretty dark with Blade. Yep. Then you got the X-Men, which was kind of a blend of humor and and dark and then you got this which definitely leaned more into the humor so this was more of like the batman 66 sensibilities but combined with at the time modern filmmaking so yeah you really got to see like okay so you could even lean into the history of what people think about but still do a good job with it Mm -hmm. great well also ironically out of those three i feel like blade i feel like both extremes on the spectrum aged better this Spider-Man movie ages better and Blade actually ages pretty damn well, amazingly, uh, compared to like the first X-Men. If you go back, I don't know. I, I recently I recently watching all three of these. The first X-Men's kind of rough. <laughs> it's kind of rough. X2 is you know amazing and, and they fixed those things. But like these two, the way they leaned into those a bit further. I mean, this is one of the most comic booky movies so far like even mm-hmm. compared to some of today's stuff like it's they lean hard into like sequences that feel like they were pulled out of the books and and dialogue too sometimes which you know kind of some of it ages better than others but it's just impressive still to see like what Raimi how much Raimi gave credence to the books and the vibe and the tone and melded that with that cinematic flavor it's odd that you have a movie that was this successful that was this popular that was this beloved and yet there's also a moment in it where you see a villain running away from the hero going we'll meet again spider-man <laughs> it's like, how, how do you get away with doing that and yet people <laughs> still love it yeah tone it's all tone if you're gonna if you're gonna embrace it from the get-go you know and uh and have going back and rewatching uh spider-man there are the scenes that that are you know burned into our brain that they're big action set pieces and and character moments but but the one that that really caught my eye watching it again was peter uh fighting flash in the hallway and mm-hmm. the the really effective way that raimi shows his powers you know it's something as simple as 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 allowing toby to sort of slow down and and process it much faster and then quickly it speeds back up and you know, just him, him nailing that tone and figuring out it's, you know, it has some of his evil dead touches to it. It has things that he brought to dark man. Um, and I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have picked him for Spider-Man back in the day, but, but now you realize that, you know, he's the blueprint. He really is. He kind of established how to, how to tell these stories and tell them the right way. I, th- I think that happens with most of these products though, where you'll, you, you know, when they announce, Oh, this person's doing this or this person's doing that. How many times have we actually seen it where they've announced things and the, and then you suddenly get a public outcry of oh god not them you know because we had it with we had it with Robert Pattinson Pattinson for 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 Batman for for the Batman and we had it back in the day for Michael Keaton for the for that 1989 Batman as well and everybody there was an outcry and then suddenly when the films come out it almost makes more of an impact then because they watch them and you'll you'll say hold on a minute, I was wrong, this really works. So I think sometimes and quite often these things happen and we are surprised by them and I think that's why it works. I think what we've learned as a society as if you're ever casting a Batman movie, just expect everyone to be angry and then probably to end up being wrong after the fact. (laughs) Michael Keaton, Heath Ledger, Ben Affleck, Robert Pattinson, like the the world decried all four of those and then the, it was just like oh our bad we were wrong they're were, they were yeah, good they're right about Clooney though right <laughs> well, he's still he's, a great he, Bruce Wayne dang it yeah, I was gonna yeah. say even that I don't know how much of that was Clooney's fault like I don't know how much he yeah. could have helped to that <laughs> it, it reminds me actually I I feel sorry for Henry Cavill because I think he's been given short shrift as Spider-Man as Superman I mean because I think he did it I think he was incredible but just was not given enough to do and it's like they've pushed him aside and I think he could have given a lot more I thought he had the presence to for that role you know what I find exciting about the next generation coming up though too is that now that we're 20 years into this golden age of comic book movies I think you're legitimately going to be getting into younger and -and up-and-coming filmmakers uh, who really were raised on these movies you know who really were fans uh, and are now taking over properties uh, and can legitimately say I was influenced by these early days where, you know, when you handed something over to Raimi was a, a Marvel fan, you know, but I don't, I don't know how much Brian Singer knew about the X-Men versus that was just a, a gig for him to take on. You know, uh, I don't think Richard Donner grew up reading Superman, but he made a tremendous Superman movie. Um, I do think we're going to see some really comic accurate transitions 
you know, from some, from some really rabid comic book fans. Now that that sort of, not that it was a, a blatant stigma, but comics weren't as cool in the seventies and eighties, you know, and now it's become, it's the driving force of pop culture. And I think it's going to shape the types of stories that are told, you know, I mean, there's the, the new Raimi is out there somewhere. And I think he's going to be found in a, he or she is going to be found in a, in a superhero movie. I mean, it's the same way that's happened with video games, right? Where like a whole generation has grown up with video games and we've seen that genre move forward in a lot of ways because people are now in control of studios and things that were immersed in it. And before there yep. was just this big stigma that like, uh, it's not a career and it's not this, it's whatever it's, it's basic things. And now we see that all this stuff is being transitioned to movies and film now. And that's a whole other thing, right? Yeah. I agree with you. I feel like comics, and especially now too, because these studios have shown they're willing to be a little experimental and they're bringing in all these characters. I mean, the fact that we have an America Chavez in the MCU now is, you know, is, is amazing. But you're just going to keep going down the list of new characters or side characters, and it opens up more possibilities for those filmmakers to find someone they really identify with and just jump all in. It doesn't have to be Spider-Man, Iron Man, Captain America. You know, yeah. it can be We're face. now at a point where Reed Richards can get introduced as a as a throwaway in a in yeah. a Doctor Strange sequel. Agree. Spoiler. Like, what? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I said earlier today on Twitter, uh, if the X-Men eventually slash finally coming into the MCU doesn't mean that I eventually get either a Jubilee movie or TV show, then what the hell are we even doing here? Oh, yes. it's happening. Yeah. That's yeah. happening. We, we need, they, need, they need to do a decent Jubilee character in the films and not waste the character like they have done before. And yes. Have I struck upon the ultimate jubilee group in this in this meeting uh, right now huge oh, with me I'm, yeah 100 yeah, oh my yeah. god i'm always so alone <laughs> oh <laughs> tremendous oh, this is amazing she's oh, outstanding wonderful I <laughs> have, she's spectacular even as a vampire i don't even oh, care i love the vampire, vampire yeah. jubilee yeah, yeah i have awesome. a wall over here that is all framed comic book frame well framed comic books and it alternates there's a variant cover a cover with jubilee on it variant cover cover with jubilee on it just nice. all across my wall uh really applause applause <laughs> nice. I mean, i'll, I'll quickly add that i thought that america chavez was fantastic that character in the doctor strange film i i loved that character i thought that was really well done <laughs> yeah agreed i wish i would have seen more of her and her backstory because mm -hmm. that, that's what's part of what's so cool about her but you know, I'm also not going to be the dude that's like, how dare you put her in a movie and make her like one of eight characters? Like, it's okay. <laughs> I <laughs> think cool. there's going to be more of her to come. I think she's going to be important in the story going ahead that they're probably going into. Otherwise, why would you bring a character that's so important as that to the in the Marvel universe? Why would you bring that just in as a side character? I think there's more to her to be to be yeah. honest in my opinion there seems to be a lot with her parents as well that, that didn't get answered like i think that she said that, that her parents were opened into like another multiverse and that mm -hmm. question never got answered so. yeah to circle it back around to Raimi, yep this is how far we've come in 20 short years like 20 years in the landscape of of movie making and storytelling is is kind of a blip you know, and we're talking about a movie where we all went through our memories of seeing Spider-Man and we were just impressed to see he, that he looked accurate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and now we're like, well, America Chavez is jumping through multiverses and you know, this. Yeah. it's crazy how fast we've yeah. evolved and this genre has evolved. And, uh, you know, there's been hits and misses that have helped shape the road for sure. But um, but it's remarkable uh, where we are now. I don't think I don't think that can be overstated. You know, the, the sheer number of superhero properties that are existing and, and are still good. It's not we're not flooding the market with mediocrity. It's still really impressive. Even just the yeah, small. I, go, go on, Rob. Oh, I was just going to say I got a kick out of it. This is mild spoilers for the very end of Eternals. But I got a kick out of we're at the point where the end credits reveal scene is Pip the Troll. <laughs> like that's how far we've come that we're yes. our big reveal is like oh pip very the troll true. is around now as well. <laughs> uh, very, very true good. oh i was going to say now <laughs> oh no i'm sorry <laughs> hard to, it's hard to follow up pip the troll honestly <laughs> it really is it really is oh i was going to say what it was is ju just to come back to the spider-man issue of it all even in that it's amazing how far the spider-man franchise just on its own has come over that time because since that first Raimi film we've now got you know the the incredible spider-verse film and the 
and the follow-ups that they're making. Um, and I believe they've got one of the uh, the Japanese TV version from the late 70s. That character's going to be in the next Spider-Verse film, allegedly, oh, wow. as well. Uh, what was it? Is it Takuya Yami, Yamashiro, is it, Sean? Is that it? I believe so. I, I wouldn't swear to it, but I believe so. That sounds about right. He's I know he's a motocross uh, rider. <laughs> And yeah. he's not quite Peter Parker, the photographer. Um, but Lord Miller said at CinemaCon that that those two that two part movie is going to have two hundred and forty characters. So I don't doubt for a minute that he's going to show up at some point. Yeah, that's going to be madness when they <laughs> fully unleash that. Wow, it's uh, crazy. So um, well, and don't forget the uh, the sp- spump, the <laughs> Sony Pictures Universe of Marvel characters, Marv. You can't can't leave out <laughs> Madam Webb's and oh, yes. the uh, and the Craven yeah. the Hunters of them. I'm of just them happy all. we're getting Spider Woman in uh, some form. I yes. please yeah. please Lord hope that it's Jessica Drew and if that I feel I'm always tentative until I actually like see a, some kind of logo or like hey we're in production or something because we've been burned so many times over the years. Sure. But I want to see like I, I want to see that character. That character could be so great. In this in this universe, is that what they're calling it? By the way, is it a fit? Like, what is the official term for the Sony Marvel universe so thing? The it's the Sony Pictures Universe of Marvel characters. The acronym is SPUMK. Oh, that's new to me, yeah. but I like it. I'll endorse that. The SPUMK. <laughs> Just watch how you say it. Yeah, you gotta be you gotta be really careful. But but they have they have access to. Without exaggeration, seven hundred characters uh, that are affiliated with Spider-Man that they that they can use uh, uh, according to their agreement with with Marvel between Sony and Marvel. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna only have two access. that they can't, there's only two that they can't. It's like Kingpin oh. and one other. I forget who the other one is that they can't have access to. I can't can't remember who it is. But if, if they're they- gonna have access to a slew of characters, Spider-Man's gallery is the one to do it. Yeah. So. Yeah, and when you go through the list because it's available somewhere, there's a PDF of it online if you just search for it. It's a staggering number of like characters you just wouldn't even know. You know, like there's people like the Enforcers and you know, ca- you know, characters that that would be familiar to everybody. And then there's just like any sort of organization that was mentioned at some point over the decades. Like they could branch off and make if they wanted to. You know, a a stilt man movie essentially. <laughs> And and the way they're rolling out El Muerto, I mean, maybe that's maybe that's going to happen. Yeah, Bad Bunny, way to go! It just oh, it just occurred to me they could make an animated Superior Foes of Spider Man movie, and how good would that be after what we saw from Into the Spider Verse? Very true. Yeah, yeah. And um, also another thing that shows how far we've come with the Spider Verse was the was how they did with No Way Home as well which, you know, the way that they brought all those characters from the old, the other Spider-Man films, you know, including the the actual individual Spider-Man characters, I think they did really well to pull out the best bits of those interpretations to bring into the film as well. So you got, when you got Toby in there and you got Andrew in there and you've got Alfred Molina in there and, and everybody else, I mean, I thought, I thought Jamie Foxx killed it in comparison to how he was in in the in the Amazing Spider-Man beforehand, so I think they've done really well with that as well, and that's shown how far we've come in this the world of superhero films as well. Yeah, for I think sure. Kevin Feige very much wants to do reclamation projects where he wants to look at things that weren't beloved, and he wants to give us a reason to go back and love it, like Endgame played so heavily into Thor the Dark World that we were like, was that better than I think it was? Maybe I should. Shang-Chi really made Iron Man 3 look a lot better in retrospect. And no matter what your opinion of the various Spider-Man movies that Mark Webb or Sam Raimi did, I think Kevin Feige just took all the elements and was like, everything about these is great. No matter what side you're on, no matter what you think of either franchise, love all of it. I think he's just so into taking things that people thought like, ah, maybe that wasn't for me and making us question whether that was ever actually the case or not. Mm, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a bit like um, going to the, going back, going to the, the, the latest Dr. Strange film again, you know, with those characters that they've brought back from other, you know, from now that they've got all the Fox things back, the Fox properties that they had, it's like, 
like I was saying before we, we started, you know, with the 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 Anson Mount of uh, playing Black Bolt, for instance, and then you've got you know Patrick Stewart reprising the role of Professor X, and then you've got um, spoiler. I mean, I've already spoiled enough already. Krasinski as you know as Mister Fantastic. It's like they've lent into that and they've given you a really good interpretation of them. Although my irritation is there's not enough of them in that film, which, which niggles at me in a way, because they are such good actors that if you gave them just about another five minutes or so, I think that that sequence would have worked better if you'd have filled those out a bit more, because there's no way that they've got Krasinski in for a role like that as a one-off. So my call here is that very soon we'll get Fantastic Four announced. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't argue against that fact. And, you know, with John Watts stepping away from that project makes me almost kind of believe that he was a placeholder until they were able to reveal that Krasinski was playing Reed Richards, you know, in, in this movie. And that then now he'll step over and, and helm, helm and potentially star in you know, that fantastic four. And I, I even think that Watts might've just done it like completely amicably as a favorite to fight Fe- like Feige. I wonder if, it, because I, it never really made a ton of sense for John Watts to move from the Spider-Man franchise to another massive property like fantastic four. Um, Marvel doesn't necessarily, or hasn't yet to this point uh, shared their directors, except the Russos, but the Russos transitioning from civil war to the Avengers movies made, made enough sense at that point. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, John Watts, for anyone who was paying attention, was just burned out by the end of uh, No Way Home, you know, and and totally understandably why. Like, that's a massive project to take on. So to to I could see him transitioning into if he was going to stay at Marvel, a smaller sort of origin story. But but Fantastic Four is going to have to be a behemoth right out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, the way you introduce that family. So I was always surprised that he was the person selected for it. And it makes a lot more sense that he's stepping away. Agreed. I think he'd be a good. He'd be good as an advisor, perhaps, because I, I always used to think that. But then again, I've got the memory of all these these comics that I've read and cartoons from back in the day, where you'd have the Fantastic Four suddenly appearing with Spider Man or vice versa. So there's always been a link in my head between those properties, anyway, because they were the first. They were the the out of the gate properties from Marvel, anyway. So they've got that history to them. For sure. That's another great example of uh, we now live in a world where Matt Murdock shows up in a scene. <laughs> and yeah, we all like, mark out for it. And we're like, I guess uh, a daredevil's part of this world now. That's great. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there shows Kevin Feige's, you know, wonderful ability to. So they've got these properties that they can use. And he's worked out that person is perfect in this role because. I still think that Daredevil was the better of the Marvel Netflix series. I think that was the standout from all of them. I like I like a lot of the what they did, but I just think that that one had something really special and Charlie Cox killed it in that role and I think that that's what Kevin Feige is really good at noticing that he's looking at these properties and he might be thinking, well that might not have worked in that role, but this person definitely worked in that role. So perhaps he's doing a bit of that now when we're seeing that with him utilizing Charlie and Patrick Stewart and these people, and in some cases recasting here where it didn't work initially and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, based on the movie that we came here to talk about and what you're saying right there, Kevin Feige had the foresight to go. Nobody wants anybody besides JK Simmons to play Jonah Jameson. Just bring him back. No one's going to take anybody, but him it's fine. So true. Yeah. So true. Agreed. He's so So indicative of the, the tone, like the tone of this movie. Because like what you were talking about before, where it leans into the the camp a little bit is, I mean, this this character doesn't work in almost like, yes, he worked in when they brought him in. Everyone popped for him in Far From Home. Right. But it was because it's like a one off thing. He doesn't work unless the rest of the world supports a ridiculous character like that. And he works so well. And it's just, it's, it's so yeah. weird. Cause there are parts of this movie that I'm like, God, that line is corny. God, that line. Why is he saying that? It's so weird. It just stands out so much. And then you get to another scene and he's, you know, get the pictures, Parker. And blah, blah, blah. This is talking all the thing. And it's just, you just buy into it. And you're like, all oh, right, whatever. 
<laughs> he just forgives it. It's he such captures a weird, that character thing. captures it. Yeah, I was going to say he captures that character so perfectly, doesn't he? Though Simmons is like he's the one character where he is the right level of over the top, yeah, out there that yeah. you have with J. Jonah Jameson, because it's always been like that. Even when you read the comics, you'll see all the the speech bubbles. And the words will be enormous because it's it's like the shouting, the speech bubbles at you with that character. And he yeah. pulled it off wonderfully. So One of the best things about a movie is when you watch it and you can just feel inside of you how much fun the actor is having in that <laughs> role. And you watch the first Spider-Man movie, anything in the Raimi trilogy that J.K. Simmons is on the screen for. And you're just like, this guy is having the time of his life. Yeah. Because you have an actor who can do this and then, you know go off to shoot some scenes for Oz the next day. And it's just like, all right, man, I guess he's just living his best life doing every version of everything. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, but like, like we're going back to the casting again, aren't we? You know, where everybody was perfect in their role. Although I, I will say what, what Sean said, actually, I think he's right that in a sense, Willem Dafoe was incredible in the first one, but in the latest one, it's like, a growth in the character and a growth in his ability in his acting as well, where he's taken that character to another role, another, a whole nother level. But yeah, it's all about the casting and, you know, I think they've pulled it off perfectly. Kirsten Dunst, you know, as MJ and everything. Well, one yeah. thing he, that uh, Defoe doesn't have to do in no way home is establish. You already know who Norman is. Uh, he's got this history of being manipulative. You're almost when he's at feast, you know, and he's uh, acting like he's the wounded puppy. You're waiting for the other shoe to drop. And then when it drops, it's it's enorm- It's fantastic. Um, you know, if we lament anything, it's that Toby and, and uh, that version of Norman Osborn didn't get a, a rematch fight. Essentially, I would like to see him. I would like to see them go toe to toe just for a little bit, but it felt like the goblin. I don't know if that was due to reshoots, but like he just kind of shows up at the end of the battle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like there's there's a there's a great bit of moment where the Spider Men are sort of trading punches with the different heroes, and that's one of the thrills to me of No Way Home is getting a chance to say like, oh, Toby Spider Man got to fight the lizard, like that's really cool, yeah. or oh, Tom's Tom Spider Man got you know caught by Sandman, like that's that's really wild. Um, and I would have liked to seen you know a little bit more of the goblin show up, but I think that they did that. I don't. I, it may have something to do with reshoots. You're right, but I think they wanted the Green Goblin to feel like the final boss of that movie. Like you have sure. all these kind of underling villains, but the Green Goblin is the boss fight. Yeah, yeah. You're going back to computer games here, aren't you, Rob? <laughs> it's like Green that. Goblin it's, is Bowser. Yeah. You're at this level. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, much I wish Andrew Martin's had a point. line. I wish Andrew okay. had a line that just said, like, Andrew should have had a line that was like, my goblin looked way sillier than you do. <laughs> <laughs> How come you don't look so weird? My, mine looked really weird. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, and Martin mentioned Kirsten Dunst as as MJ. And one of the things I did not, I was not a fan of Dunst, Dunst's <laughs> MJ uh from like when i first saw it like it was fine but like i was never like like i don't know it just didn't click for me and so when i was going into it i was kind of prepared to have that same feeling and i and i came away actually very much appreciating her in a different way uh mostly from her scenes with toby because there's like two key scenes between them throughout this movie where especially one where they're at the the house like they're at his house and and she was just like left uh, her dad yelling at her and everything out of the house and they have a conversation. And then mm-hmm. later on, there's another conversation where they're in the street. Cause that's when he realizes like, she's not acting yet and stuff like that. And there's a, there's a sense that like Holland has done a really good job of this, but Raimi captured a genuineness in that version of Peter Parker that I don't think has been touched. And mm-hmm. it's really impressive because if Toby is not all the way listening she's having reactions to him just like listening to her like even through while she's talking it's really impressive like i came away going like okay maybe i was wrong like maybe i i short changed her when i first watched this because there's some really great stuff between them going on so i wanted to give her props because i felt i felt bad i was like 
self-conflicted when I was watching. <laughs> watching no, the I, I 100% agree. I've always thought like, oh, she's definitely one of the weaker points in the original trilogy. And then when I rewatched the 2002 film today, I was like, I like her much more than I swear I used to. Yeah, that's how I felt. And I it's definitely her performance because I don't think her character is written great, but her performance is a lot better than I think I used to give it credit for. I can't understand it. And one of the things that bothered me about the first Raimi film, if, if, if probably the, the main thing that bothered me about the main Raimi film is that if you're going to start with Mary Jane, fine, start with Mary Jane. Although I think they should have started with Gwen, but why they started with Mary Jane and then, and then leaned so heavily into the most famous Gwen Stacy element, which is you put her on the top of a bridge. Like I, when I first saw that and I, I look, I was being nitpicky fanboy. But I was like, why did they do that? How come they yeah. took MJ and put her into the, the the significant Gwen Stacy scene? And then the more I thought about it after the fact, I was like, then if you're going to put her up there, then you should just kill her off. You know, because while she's an, she's an important element of part two, because of the way that it's written, by the time you get to three, three is really just... People are coming back because they're part of the franchise now, yeah. you know, like, and I, I kind of give credit to superhero movies at this point now that they are okay with cut and bait, you know, and moving on to, uh, to new characters. If, if the, if the other people don't necessarily fit into the franchise, it's not always just like, well, we're doing the next so-and-so. So we got to bring everybody back because you yeah. recognize these faces. Um, but in, in the Raimi trilogy, by the time you got to three, it really was like everyone needed screen time uh, because that's just the way sequels were made at that point. And, uh, and, and it always bothered me that they kept the, the main love interest around when, when one of the things that Spider-Man fans appreciate the most is the loss that's affiliated with Gwen Stacy and how it would have affected Peter uh, going into two, you know, it would have given him a true motivation for not wanting to be the hero anymore, you know, and throwing the, throwing the suit away. So I, some of those elements I always felt like could have been worked out a little bit better on the script. Well, going it's into to say this about something that Sam Raimi did, but do you think killing Mary Jane or killing a love interest in this franchise would have been too dark for what this franchise was shooting for? Maybe probably. Yeah, I think so. You know, th- I think that there are things that comic book movies can do now because the audience is is more attuned to these shocks. Um, yeah, I think you're 100 percent right in saying that. I mean, I was wrecked and amazing, you know, in in. Um, oh, my God. Andrew Garfield. Amazing thank you. Blanking on his amazing name. But Andrew Garfield's, <laughs> I was shocked when I mean, when they kill Gwen there. Spoiler, I know for that movie. But like when they kill Gwen there <laughs> like that, that still rocked me. The, it was the way it was executed and everything. I was still that hit me. Yeah, like that was such a brutal breaks. death scene as well. Oh, terrible. My God, it's the sound. Yeah. Too. It's the, the way they execute that. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. It still wrecks me. It still wrecks me. So maybe at the time, I, I think for sure, probably too. But but I think to um to Sean's point, it was weird that they combined those things. And that, so then, okay, so if you are going to go that route, I was like, well, then why? My biggest pet peeve with Marvel sometimes when it comes to Spider Man is that like it's okay to wreck his life but you don't have to wreck everything about his life. People typically need at least one or two things of stability to like be sane, right? <laughs> and make it through all these things. And so they sometimes refuse to just let them be happy. Like it's okay to actually have something in your life like happy, especially like Spider-Man is like one of the most tragic characters around, right? He's had so many things happen to him. He's like had to go around another person's body and like, you know what I mean? Like so many things. So let him like let's develop a relationship and you can still have so many interesting conflicts with people together. Like you can actually make conflict. And sometimes it's Hollywood does this thing of like we want to the will or won't they. And that gets very boring very quickly, mm-hmm. if not executed correctly. So at the end of this, they it's such a great scene. And then they do that little swerve of like, but I have to turn away for a hero. And I was like, why? You were being such a dumbass like what do you have to do that (laughs) you can actually do both peter you're a scientist you're supposed to be smart you can do both things it's okay like i don't know i i saw that and was like really like really we gotta do that because then in two right we spent so much time on that and i was like i would rather just see them develop a real relationship over the course of a movie instead of this parroting apart thing and i think that feeds Mm -hmm. into sean's point of like by three you're just like okay it's too you know, they never really went one way or the other with it. So then you just kind of end up in the middle and right. nothing's developed. So, yeah. Well, the pr- problem with three is that there were too many um, 
too many problems in the way with that film anyway, where you had pressure from certain people to do this sort of thing, that sort of thing, and the other. So you you you, you feel bad in a way for Sam Raimi because he's being told, no, we want this in there, we want that in there. And essentially he was making a film that he didn't really want to make mm. in, in essence. That, that happens, yeah. you know especially in, in franchises that are making the amount of money that those Spider-Man movies are making. And it's, it's worth pointing out that I think, I believe that Spider-Man three is the most successful of them, of them all financially. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, of the three Raimi's anyway, you know, the, the, the Marvel ones have now surpassed it, but because they had Venom, baby. Yeah, kids <laughs> love Venom. <laughs> People love Venom. Everyone except Sam Raimi loves Venom. <laughs> <laughs> We were all there day one to see that 70s show guy play Venom. <laughs> That's still such an odd casting, oh, even all these years later. so bizarre. <laughs> the, I, no, that's, no cast- shade on Topher. Like, Topher Grace is awesome. He's been in other stuff. He's been great. So that's no shade, but just such an odd pairing. It really is. At oh. least I can understand what Tom Hardy is doing now. You know, like, it's, it's a very unusual choice to do venom as as a buster keaton physical comedy <laughs> but if you're gonna do it do it and, and he's committed to it you know 100 percent. but whatever they were trying to do in three they just didn't get it they didn't get it, it it's funny you mentioned that because it's just reminded me that when the when spider-man 3 came out or was coming out and they were advertising the whole thing with venom I, I had this image and I thought oh great we're gonna get the alien costume saga in 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 live action and it was so far from that as well, but unfortunate. Mm-hmm. You didn't remember the part in the comic books where Peter grew his hair out over his face and went jazz dancing? <laughs> no, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, Todd McFarlane drew it. It looked great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That would have been amazing. Oh, my Lord. Right? Can we get a variant of that place yeah that would have been fantastic <laughs> mcfarland peter with long hair over his face <laughs> those things are so bad but then i also it's one of those things that it, they always get a pass because i know Raimi didn't want to do the thing anyway and was i always view them more as a middle finger to the studio than i do actual <laughs> scenes you know so Honestly, my take on Spider-Man 3 is it gets so much crap for the the emo Peter Parker stuff, but you watch Spider-Man 3 and then you watch this movie and it's like, what from Spider-Man 3 wouldn't fit in this movie? Uh, It's the same exact tone. I don't understand why people got the three and was like, well, no, this is stupid. Is this stupider than the scene on the rooftop where like the Green Goblin smacks Spider-Man in the head (laughs) and then leans out on a skylight? Like these movies are all about having weird, (laughs) silly visuals. (laughs) Yeah, very yeah, true. The, the dialogue in Spider-Man pull- Three is like incredible as well. Like he's just like, "I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye." I think that's in Spider-Man yeah. Three. And mm-hmm. uh, there's a bit as well where it's like, uh, "You want forgiveness? Uh, get religion." That's a great line. Uh, just the the dialogue is just ramped up by a hundred in that one. I like playing a fun game of. Um all the different roles that Gwen Stacy has in Spider-Man three. Like when we first meet her, <laughs> she's in Peter's class. Like she's the competitive uh, classmate who's smarter than he is later on. She's a fashion model uh, <laughs> getting her picture taken for like for photocopiers. Uh, then at some point she's so prevalent that she, uh, you know, hosts the Spider-Man fan appreciation parade. <laughs> There's all <laughs> these different things that they keep attaching the Gwen. So that's that's the worst dialogue ever in any film of all time when uh, Eddie Brock shows up and <laughs> they're like, who is that hanging up there? And he's like, I think it's Gwen. Oh, by the way, I'm dating your daughter. It's like, what? Yeah. What? yeah, that was rough. Yeah. She's hanging for her life, for God's sakes. It's not the time, Eddie. <laughs> oh my god it's so true <laughs> do, so the, the different spider-man films that they've made since um do, do, can you think of any areas where they might have where they've where they've gone really right with the films and some areas where they've gone wrong with the films uh i'm not a massive fan of ned to be honest i'm not I don't know what you guys think about him. Ned is exactly the type of character that I was talking about earlier that would have been terrific for Homecoming and then yeah. didn't need to stay around. <laughs> didn't necessarily yeah. need to be a big part of. Hey, listen. Hey, apparently he's going to become the next villain. I've no, heard stop. Him. Yeah, no. that's what I've heard. <laughs> Stop it. Stop yeah. it. No, stop. That's that only going to happen if Marvel Ned. go away from this. Yeah. I think I love Ned because I see myself in Ned. 
<laughs> if I was the <laughs> if I was the like friend of a superhero, I'd be exactly like Ned. Like it would be exactly like him. Question. And that's why he, he is, was perfect for Homecoming. True. You yes. know, like yeah. he was the counterpart to this kid who was suddenly an Avenger, and it was yeah. so earnest. And then I just felt like the other times, like from Far From Home and and No Way Home, they weren't better in No Way Home. You know, but now all yeah. of a sudden he can open portals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I think I always compare him to I think he gets a he gets probably gets a little bit of a pass from me one because yes I see myself in him but two I just do not like and again no shade to the actor but I just do not like Flash in the new movies never oh, yeah oh, yeah never totally resounded agree. for me so because I'm always seeing him that that's the one that's like man it sticks out to me all the time so I'll probably just ignore <laughs> other other things but yeah it just doesn't even the one in this Spider-Man in the first one is better because that's like, okay, he's, he's kind of a bully. He treats him like a jerk. He's kind of this yeah. and that he's, he's the, you know, he's the popular guy. Like all that comes across and you're like, okay, like, yeah, it's bare bones and it needs development, obviously, but still I know that's flash. And then I watch these movies and I'm just like, that never comes. It never, I can't buy that guy as uh agent venom later. You know what I mean? Like I no. can't, I can't buy it. <laughs> I can't buy that guy. Like Other you dude? could buy Joe Manganiello as turning into Agent Venom eventually, <laughs> getting a, a conscience, becoming yeah. his own hero. Like weird, no, dorky fanboy Flash. Yeah, it's like no, you're not going to be a hero. <laughs> it's not going to happen for you. But, but what 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 Sean, Sean said though about you know Ned being perfect for Homecoming, it's almost like he would be like us if we were best friends of a superhero. Say if we were best friends of Batman, if he went out to the toilet we'd be there fidgeting and playing with all of his gadgets. And that's Ned to a T. Yeah. There is a really, just a simple visual gag when they're in his uh, room, just sort of brainstorming what to do next. And they eventually cut back and Ned's wearing the mask. Cause of course you'd grab the mask and put it on a hundred percent. So, I mean, Paul, growing up, Paul Rudd grabbed the shield when Chris Evans was in the bathroom. Like, we're all going to do it. Like, no matter what age, I feel like it's, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're 60 or you're five, you're going to grab it. You're like, yeah, I want to try course. that. That looks yeah, cool. Of course. Super sweet. <laughs> um, I actually got a jet. Uh, I got to come back. But this has been amazing. I really wish I could just sit on here and, and talk more because this has been so fun. I, I really appreciate everyone inviting me me on okay matt do you want nice to quickly tell you, everybody how to get hold of you and where, where to find you and everything and all about comic oh, book nation uh, yeah of course uh you can check out our comic book nation podcast live on twitch on fridays at 11 a.m central standard time uh and then of course we are on sunday mornings on paramount plus as well as part of et life uh and then you can catch all my uh fun theatrics typically just talking about olaf and wrestling and comics uh on twitter at matt aguilar cb and of course you can catch all my articles in comic.com thank you matt thanks for this take care no you guys have a great day cheers bye right so um actually, it makes me feel better because the last time i talked with you marv i was the one who had to jet early yes i'm in for the long true. haul today i don't have to run away this time you are but i think i think sean's busy today aren't you sean i'm gonna bounce yeah but i mean if any any other topics you want to go over before i scoot off I don't know what to say. Have you got any, um, here we go, bit of advert promotion for yourself. Have you got any sort of like stories that you know or anecdotes to do with the Sam Raimi films that you found out during your research? So much. Um, I spent a lot of time on the first Raimi film because, you know, as we know, it's the one that started it all. And I got a chance to speak with John Dykstra uh, and, and figure out a lot of the stuff that they did with visual effects to make him look convincing and the way that they did um, comparative shots between a stunt man trying to pull off even just wall crawling, you know, they were really trying to figure out the physics of of bringing the the, the motion that Spider Man does uh, in a comic book to live action, and then and then visual effects where they were able to get to, uh, and and apparently they screened both of them for the studio executives. They had a fully visual uh, VFX driven spider-man walking up the wall and and again because he's completely masked uh it's easier to do it because the human face is one of the most difficult things for them to do at that time uh, and then they had a stuntman do it and they said that the studio executives couldn't tell the difference between like who was the stuntman and who was the visual effect and that gave them the confidence to do as much as they could in the live action but the person who i enjoyed speaking to the most was the costume designer uh jim atchison who worked on all three of the raimi films 
and got uh, very candid uh, about the distaste uh, for Sp- uh, for Spider Man three and the black costume and and how no one in there he really believed that the black suit by the time they got to that point should have been completely uh, a visual effect a, a VFX and and the fact that they had to just do the black suit version of what the existing uh, costume was w- bothered him to no end. He also tells some really great stories about when the, by the time he got hired on to the to the movie, they'd already um, hired out a creative team to do Goblin's mask. And he hated it, like just hates everything about the shell of the Goblin mask. And in fact, it's funny, you were bringing up the, the rooftop scene. He said when he sat down to watch that movie opening weekend or, or with an audience, that was the scene that he feared the most because he just knew how goofy it was going to look because Willem Dafoe had to speak through that, you know, with the mask, the little mouth that opened. And you could, he's like, we we didn't solve how to have Willem Dafoe give a performance <laughs> through that mask. Um, but, you know, he talked at length about the the time crunch that they were on for that movie and, and designing the suit. Um, and needing it to fit a body type uh, because they had up to that, you know, you can have up to 15 different stuntmen who always have to be wearing the suit and look exactly like Toby so that, you know, you don't know who who's in the shot essentially in that moment. And they were really waffling about who they were going to cast. And um, Jim just kept saying to Sam, like, I need to know, you know, what it's going to look like, what, what the main character is going to look like. So at one point, he tells this great story about how he was so fed up with Sam uh, being so indecisive and going back and forth that he filled a room with 20 uh, men in Speedos of all different body types. And he brings Sam Raimi in and he just says, point at one. <laughs> like, <laughs> point, what is he going to look like? And he said Raimi was, you know, in his suit and couldn't look more flustered and essentially just points at a guy who was pretty ripped, like a bodybuilder type thing. And James Ashton's like, great. You know, I'm going to go forward from that point on and, and design it that way. And then he goes and then he goes and chooses cast, cast Toby Maguire, who is this, you know, string bean bean pole of, a, of an actor. And, uh, you know, so but he tells great stories about them not realizing that, you know, Spider-Man's face is covered for, for completely. And how do you have an actor, you know, in that suit for for the amount of time that they have to be? And that's where you know, we see uh, pictures now of like the eyes being taken out and where Tom Holland sipping on a straw, you know, to drink something. And uh, you know, these are all things that they have to solve in the moment. And I I love all the behind the scenes stuff about that. And so there's a ton of great stories for for, for the Raimi films and the web films and and then all through the Marvel stuff uh, in the book. So, but the, the I love that story about <laughs> Raimi pointing at dudes and speedos. Classic. <laughs> so, so when you when you were when you were starting to come up with the, to came up with the idea for doing the book, what 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 was the initial? How did you plan out how you were going to write the book and everything? You the how does it go? Do you do the research and then write the book? How how did you plan that out? The, the first story that I wanted to, to explore, which made me realize uh, initially the book was going to be about um, versions of Spider-Man movies that never came to pass. Uh, I was going to do some stuff on the Jim Cameron one. I was going to do some stuff on the Canon films and all that stuff ends up going in there. Um, but there, the, the story of Andrew Garfield going to Comic-Con and surprising the fans uh, in the audience where he t- you know takes off the mask and, and gives that extremely heartfelt speech. I go back and rewatch that speech, you know, every couple of months essentially because I just find it to be so uplifting. And as I started noodling through like what could I write about from Spider-Man standpoint, I was like I want to know I want to know the story behind that day. You know, like who who came up with that idea? Uh how did they pull it off? Where did that store-bought costume come from? You know, what was the vibe before it and after it? So I got a chance to talk to to Avi and and Matt Tomac, uh, who is the producer on all the Raimi films and then the web films, and Amy Pascal uh, and and Andrew about and and just got the the behind the scenes of that story. And and once all of those came together, and that became like my sample chapter that I shopped around to publishers. I was like, now I'm going to single out all the things that I think are really interesting to Spider-Man fans and try to get the stories behind them. So I have a whole section about Shailene Woodley's uh, Mary Jane Watson and and what happened, you know, why why that fell apart essentially. Um, and with the uh, MCU ones, I get into just the ways that they wanted it to be 
different from what came before it. You know, it always became like, I wanted to study the evolution of this character and what did all these different people learn at all these uh, different stages to get us to the point of where we are now. And what I didn't realize when I started doing that is that I didn't even know that No Way Home was going to be a thing. And so now you get to the point where you have a movie where the three generations of Spider-Man come together. Uh, and and so I, I love the fact that, that that this book tells the story of, of of their stories and then sort of culminates with them sharing the screen. So. Yeah, there's a strange um, thing about that where, so you've got that with this new book that you've got coming out, and then something similar happened with the previous book that you brought out, the release the Snyder Cut, and all of a sudden yeah. the book came out and they released the Snyder Cut. And they released, yes, yeah, so I'm going to write about uh, Peace in the Middle East next. Uh, <laughs> my third book. Yeah. You have the magic touch. Go for uh, it. I, I must. <laughs> I must. I'm going to write the, the story Snyder... about the time everybody just found a million dollars. The Snyder Cut one blew my mind. You know, like the 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 idea that 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 I was just intrigued by that story, and I was intrigued by what happened to Zach, and I was intrigued by his fan base fighting so hard to 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 realize it and to get it to get it uh, recognized in some way, shape, or form. And I, I always intended that to have an open ended. Uh, conclusion of just like if this movie ever comes to pass uh, these are probably the people who made it happen and then uh, literally as I'm getting up to the point of having to turn the manuscript into the publisher uh, HBO Max reveals that they're going to announce it and so I basically said to the publisher like you got to give me another month you know you got to you got to kick it back because now I got to change a lot and and interview the people who 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 won and give them give them their victory lap so it was a it was a good problem to have so going back to the the first uh, Sam Raimi Spider Man film, um, was 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 everybody in in the in the staff the crew were, were they all set in stone from the off or are there some stories about people that came and went in that as well? No, everyone who Sam sort of brought on board was was on board with the production, you know. But at that point, for for all of them, it was a job, you know. They they didn't realize what they were necessarily putting together, and and. I don't think that they quite fully understood the significance of the character or the or the global popularity of the of the character. It wasn't until that movie sort of came out that they realized what they'd tapped into. Although, you know, Sony will say that they were really excited to all of these studios are really excited when they have a, a property that could potentially become a franchise. Um, but the one of the stories that that blows my mind, you know, to this day, I'll never quite process it, is that. Marvel was trying to license their characters out to these different studios and get these films made. And um, when Sony came around with their offer uh, that they wanted to purchase the rights to Spider-Man, Marvel was just coming out of a bankruptcy and was desperate for an infusion of cash. And they said, hey, we'll give you all, everyone that we have the rights to uh, for $25 million. And this, you know, would have been everyone who you see in the MCU right now. The only ones that they couldn't give were the ones who were at Fox at that point, which was the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. Uh, but everyone else could have gone to Sony. And Sony said, uh, nah, we're not, into, we don't want, we, we only see value in Spider-Man. So they took Spider-Man for 10 million, but they could have had the entire ensemble for 25. And whoever, the guy's name is John Calley. He was the executive at Sony at that time. And I, I guarantee that dude wakes up every day and just thinks, good, what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> how did I, how did I let that go? So, I have to say though, I think the rest of us are all very thankful that he did. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's very true. But everything about the first uh, Spider-Man film is absolutely perfect. So, you know, you've got the great work of, uh, you know, the, Sam Raimi, it is it is but it is best with with the directing, and then the the music as well is is incredible. The music, and I, I love the points in the film where the music leans into the old theme tune from back in the day from the comics that we used to do. I, I always love those bits in the film. There's sort of a magic to the to the music itself as well that that fits with the film perfectly. For sure, but I got to give a hat tip to to Michael Cicchino and the way that he uh, pulled. The, the 60s, the 1960s theme into the orchestral moments from Homecoming. That gave me such a rise. Um, you know, I think, and I, maybe you guys agree, the reason why Sp Spider-Man 2 is preferred to me is because it just had a, a, Raimi had more confidence. You know, he now realized that like people were digging his interpretation of the character. And so that's where you get the Dr. Octopus, you know, birth in the, in the surgery room. And, um, you know, like the fact that Sam Raimi can do uh, a three minute Peter with mops, you know, joke 
it's just, he just has the ability to do that. And you know, he loves the, the, the goofy physical comedy of that and, and the ability to keep bringing Bruce Campbell back and let him increase his, his part. Uh, yeah, Bruce, Bruce might have my favorite line, you know, in when he changes or gives Spider-Man his name at the wrestling match. <laughs> Oh you know, yeah, yeah. The definitely. human spider, the human spider, that sucks. <laughs> it's, great. it's great. It's just great. And then he brings him back in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness as well. He does. Yeah. Oh, we, all, exactly. we all sat through the credits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that end bit was brilliant with Bruce. That's brilliant. That's great. And he gives the Evil Dead laugh into the camera, and it's like, yep, yeah, okay, that's good. I'm here for that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with you, Sean. I think the second one is actually better for for and, and I don't. I can't. I can't put my hand. I can't put my finger on exactly why. But there's something about it that has a has a quality that the first one didn't quite get. And, well, we talked um, about how this movie, the 2002 movie, leans into the campiness, and it does. And I think a lot of times, honestly, to this movie's detriment, it does get a little over goofy, a little over campy. And I feel like in the second one, there's definitely still moments like that, but it has definitely reeled itself back in and feels more the stakes feel higher. Everything feels a little bit more, I don't want to say dire, but serious. Like uh, the train scene. Like, can you picture the train scene in this movie? It wouldn't have fit. That would have felt too, too momentous for anything else going on here. Like, we don't have time for a train scene. We have to have a Macy Gray concert. Hold on now. <laughs> so you get to Spider-Man 2 and you can do the train scene. And it's you look at that scene and it's like, yes, that is the character of Spider-Man that I've read my whole life just going above and beyond what he should be able to do because he has to save people yep very true best thing about the macy gray scene though is uh is the stan lee cameo <laughs> that's fair is that his first cameo is it in all of marvel no he was in x-men before this definitely oh, okay. yeah. yeah if you go far enough back he was in some of the uh was it wasn't he in the uh the trial of the incredible hulk back in the day yes, as well he was yes mm, he was yeah sitting in the jury box absolutely He's, he's all over the place. And, uh, oh, what's that cartoon that he's in? Oh, I can't remember now. He's in a cartoon, he in isn't the... he, that's not any, any not a Marvel property, isn't he? Oh. I can't remember what it is. Oh, it's a famous film now. With, um, so there's a um, there's an anecdote on the script uh, before Raimi got his hands on uh, David Kep's version, where Stan was pushing um, a version of a, of a screenplay by uh, John Brancato and Ted Newsom. And uh, it was very similar to, you know, it had a lot of similar elements to what Raimi ended up in, in to the point where there was going to be a wrestling scene. Uh, but they had scripted Hulk Hogan into the scene. And they were pretty confident that they could get Hulk Hogan for it because Stan Lee was super popular with wrestlers because of his connection to Lou Ferrigno and, uh, you know, just the circles that he ran in in New York City. And I, I just would have loved to see Hulk Hogan in a Spider-Man movie. That would have been so great. Based on would've what he did good, in Rocky, but, in Rocky would it have been better than Bonesaw? No, probably not. <laughs> Bonesaw is terrific. Bonesaw's great. Savage's voice, man. Like no one's ever gonna have a voice like him. Right. Very true. We need a Bonesaw movie next. Let's get that sorted out. Sony will do it. Don't you yeah, say it out loud. Will. Sony will do it. <laughs> not that they should, but they will. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, but they keep announcing all these things, and sometimes we don't see these films like you know the the uh, you know um, uh, Black Sable and all those characters. They've not had their films yet. Yeah, mm. like how many different times have they said, "Oh, we're going to do a Sinister Six movie"? It's confirmed, and then nothing comes of that. Well, I think they were I trying for that at the end of the Amazing Amazing Spy Amazing Spider Man. You know, at the end of that, I think they were going towards that sort of level, and then that didn't work out. Oh, for sure. sure. Drew Goddard was on on tap to he had a screenplay for it and he was going to direct it. Oh, the Drew problem Goddard. is they tried. Oh, to... I didn't know that he was the one who was attached to it. OK, that would have been he... I was more interested to see it now. <laughs> yeah, he would he would have directed it and um, had a script for it and everything, too. The problem is they just tried. They tried to build an entire universe in one movie. Yeah. And that's, you know, they lumped everything into Amazing Spider-Man 2. Uh, then, would you guys yeah. prefer to have uh, an Amazing Spider-Man 3 or a Spider-Man 4? inherently amazing yeah. spider-man 3 i want more andrew garfield in that role but if you told me that the rumors are true and if there is a spider-man 4 it's going to be about bruce campbell being mysterio then i have pause 
then, you know, I'll question whether I want that or not. But unless that is the story, I definitely want Amazing Spider-Man 3. I think I'd have to agree with that. I, I do feel like No Way Home truly gave Toby closure. Uh, whereas I feel like Andrew still got sort of short shrifted. Um, he had great moments in No Way Home, you know, but that franchise got ripped out of his hands. And I would love to see him get one last great shot, you know. And he, he genuinely I, loves the character as well. You can tell so much. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That, that other one, I had to look it up, by the way. The the other um, Stan Lee cameo in, an, in, in a film outside of Marvel is uh, Big Hero 6. Oh, right. That's true. Yes. I thought that was a Marvel property, though. Like, it's not MCU, but I thought they did have Big Hero 6. I might be mistaken on that. I thought no, they, I they were right. doing comics on that first. That might be right. Maybe. So, anyway, what, what, do, what do you see then coming in the future for, for, for the Spider-Man um, franchise, Sean? I think eventually they're going to have a Spider-Man in the, in the Sony universe. Um, th- there's talk about them wanting to do a mix of very similar to what Marvel does right now, where they'll have some television properties on a streaming service that Sony has yet to launch. Sony is going to have to have a streaming service at some point. Everyone else has one. Warner Brothers says HBO Max, Disney has Disney Plus. Sony's going to have to do one to keep up. And they've they've tapped Lord Miller to to do, I think Silk is supposed to get a a, a limited series. And I think you might see some characters that that sort of pop up, you know, in that format, the way that you're getting a Moon Knight show now or a Hawkeye show or something like that. Um, But the Sony universe is going to need a Spider-Man and I think because of the establishment of a multiverse, you can still have Tom Holland be the MCU Spider-Man and, and audiences would accept the fact that like, oh, there's just a different Spider-Man who's part of that universe. They would even scratch the surface of Miles Morales. Like they could do a, a Miles trilogy that lasts 10 years, you know, like there's still so much to do. Um, and they're, they're going to continue. Sony is never going to stop, stop making these movies because they, okay, Morbius didn't do great, but the two Venom movies made money. You know, they really did. And, uh, and and until they can figure out a way to make a damn Sinister Six movie, because they're not going to give give up, <laughs> they're going to put everything into it. And you know, if if Craven comes around and does well, it's 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 a vote of confidence for what they're doing. So um, I don't see Marvel uh, getting Spider Man back fully. I think so. Sony will hold on to him for as long as they they possibly can. And uh, and I'd love to see them, you know, introduce a television component and explore some characters that way. They'll continue to do animated features. Uh, and, and as long as they're still as creative as, as Into the Spider-Verse was, you know, that's it's unlimited. The, there's plenty of place for imaginative, imaginative storytellers to come over and, and explore Spider-Man's universe in, in animation. Like, who'd have thought we'd have had, if you're a Batman fan, that you'd have a Lego Batman movie, you know, that explored that that entire side. So um, it, it's really, it's it's unlimited, the things that they can do. So, yep. Um, I mean, in, in some ways, um, when, when I watched Into the Spider-Verse, I, I sort of thought, in a sense, that if they're able to lean into using Lord and Miller more often, in a sense, use them as their own version of Kevin Feige, in essence, mm-hmm. I think they've got a really good team there. If they, could, it's it's a bit like it's almost like you need an overarching person who's got the the plan there. And in this case, if you had Lord and Miller there, who obviously have got that scope and the ability to see and have ideas because God, there's, there's nothing like into the spider verse out there. That film is just, you've got these films and then you've got that film. So Mm. they've got the ability and the knowledge and the scope to be able to look at these different things. So if you had some people, people like them in charge, I think their films, their, you know, spider verse as they're calling it all spunk. Did you say (laughs) spunk? The spunk. Thank yes. you. Come on, Watch get it right. Say that. Oh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't have the uh, the the you know the draw of the MCU. You know, you could say the MCU, yeah. and everyone knows who you're talking about. Yeah. Well, you the went DCEU. on the conversations and brought up the spunk. Uh, you're going to get looked at oddly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if they had people like that actually in charge that had this vision, then I think they'd be in a completely different place than they are of now. Mm-hmm. Of course. I think it's risky, though, because we've seen so many different 
individual studios try to do the MCU and it doesn't work for anyone but the MCU. Universal mm-hmm. wanted to do a, a Dark Monsters universe and it just fell flat on its face. The DCEU is much better off when they're doing properties that are unrelated to each other because when they tried to make it an MCU of their own, it just didn't work. And Sony with Venom and Morbius, I mean, these aren't properties that seem like they're going to make a a big universe anybody cares about. So I think Sony would be better off. And I agree, Lord and Miller, let them handle animated stuff. Let them do let them do anything they want after Into the Spider-Verse. You give them control to do anything they want. But I think you just kind of make properties as they come to you. I don't think you worry about making your own MCU because you don't have Kevin Feige and he's the only person with the track record to do this right now. Just make good properties with the talent that you have available. Star Wars has to learn that too. And Star Wars is learning that the hard way as well. You know, Kathleen Kennedy is not that person. So they should just keep making, you know, individual type stuff that's not connected to the, to the main trilogy, Mm -hmm. you know, the way that Rogue One had to be and, you know, even the Mandalorian is now, you know, showing connections to Clone Wars and things like that. Like, go far away. Go do something completely different in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, you have a whole galaxy. It's far away. You can go to anywhere <laughs> in the galaxy. You don't have to have everybody like, oh, I talked to Mando a few days. Ago. No, they don't have to. They're fine. Right. We got to go to Tatooine. <laughs> uh, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I bet you enjoyed uh, Spider-Verse, didn't you, Morgs, being an uh, animated fan? Yeah, like, the Spider-Verse is insane. Like, one of my favorite films like ever made. And I'm just looking forward to if um, there's a good animated Spider-Man series coming in the future. Because uh, I don't think I've seen one that I've liked quite as much as the 90s one, uh, which is uh, it's on Disney Plus as well, so you can stream that there as well. And it's just like, that's one of my favorite shows as well. Well, they have that freshman year, right? They announced yeah, freshman the freshman year, year I've series. Got, I've got the, the book of that one. Yeah, I haven't read it yet. Though. So that could be really exciting as well, too. Yeah, that would be good to do. Absolutely. Anyway, thanks for speaking with me today, guys. So, uh, Sean, where can they uh, find? Where can people find yourself and uh, let people know all about Real Blend, Cinema Blend, and everything that you're doing? Sure, Cinema Blend uh, on a daily basis. We are. Um, you know, re- reporting on all your entertainment needs there. We have a weekly podcast called Real Blend where we do deep dives into the news of the week. And we often have a, a filmmaker guest on, uh, do with two of my friends. And then you can find me on social media at Sean underscore O'Connell because there's a mixed martial arts guy who has my name and <laughs> is extremely popular. He's and, uh, should, you, should you fight him for that name? I, he can have it. <laughs> totally fine with me. Um, and then the book is coming out in November 1st. It's up for pre-order uh, right now at, at Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all the different places where you uh, can order books. So find a uh, discount copy of it. And it's called With Great Power. And it's going to trace um, Spider-Man's entire Hollywood history uh, up to this point, which continues to grow. So maybe I'll, I'll do an addendum in a couple of years, add some more chapters about Venom 3 and then Madam Web, <laughs> whoever Sydney Sweeney is playing. Absolutely. What about yourself, Stu? Stu World Order? Uh, yeah, so I have the Stu World Order podcast where we review random comic book movies drawn by our guest, and my show is nothing but full of happy accidents. So I will be recording two days from now for an episode where somebody randomly drew Spider-Man one. So I got to watch it today for two different shows made me very happy. And I also have the website swoproductions.com where we have articles every single weekday, uh, pop culture stuff, some fiction. We're getting a lot more fiction on there nowadays, just different articles every single weekday. And on Twitter, it is at SWO productions. And that's usually just my meandering nonsense, but I, I enjoy it. Yeah, including uh, information on Pop Tarts, apparently. Oh yeah, Pop Tart Quest on the website. Very huge. I am going through every flavor of Pop Tarts I can get my hands on and reviewing them for people. There are so many. And Morgs, what what are you up to? Yeah, yeah. So we're uh, at the Docast on um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Spotify as well. Uh, So we should be coming back uh, in about a month. We've got an episode coming with uh, Nancy Cartwright, who voices Bart. So that's exciting. Um, and yeah, so we'll be launching that too. And if you fancy any true crime, uh, it's at The Untitled Chronicles on Spotify and uh, Instagram as well. Which episode is Nancy talking about? 
Um, she's talking about, um, I'm not too sure. We haven't worked out yet, but she, she will be on next week. So we're going to find out. So so these people that, that have worked on uh, in The Simpsons, they pick yeah. an episode that's a favourite of theirs to discuss. Yeah, so they, with they pick our favourite episodes, yeah. So we had we had Bill Oakley on, that was good, where he talks about who shot Mr Burns. That's a classic <laughs> episode. Yeah, that was a good one. Anyway, you can find pods like us on Instagram, Twitter, and on uh, TikTok. Just look for at pods like us. And also we have a Patreon if you just look for at pods like us there as well. And you can contact me on pods like us at gmail.com. Anyway, thank you for speaking with me today, guys. This was so much fun. Yeah, thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, everyone. Had a great time. Appreciate you having us on. And I think my neighbours are irritated because of it being nearly half past midnight over here. <laughs> Take care, guys. Have a good one. Thank you very much. You Thanks guys. for listening. I hope you're listening again right. to another episode of Pods Like Us. Hello, hello. What's up? Hey, how you doing? Everybody hear me okay? I can hear you, Sean. How are you yeah. doing? Oh, terrific. Wonderful. How are you, boys? Not bad. Matt? What's going on? How are you? All right. Stu, Rob, how are you doing? Oh, I'm Stu. good. How are I'm <laughs> good. How are you? You catch me out, Rob. I never know whether to call you Rob or Stu. <laughs> <laughs> They're both good. I respond to either. It's fine. This is Rob Stewart, you see. Yes. Morgs, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. How are you doing? Are you getting your, your show back on, uh, shows back on soon, Morgs? Yeah, it should be coming back soon. A couple of months, just getting everything ready. That's cool. That's cool. Morgs does uh, Dowcast all about uh, The Simpsons, and he talks to people who worked on The Simpsons as well. Nice. That's yeah, a cool really theme. Yeah, trying to get it back up and running again. And Stu, he does uh, a show called Stu World Order, where they pick a different superhero film each episode and talk about it whether it's one of the better films or riskier films shall we say oh okay. what do you think about the new doctor strange film i liked it i thought it was good i mean i is it top 10 in my mcu no but it's good i yeah. enjoyed it i like that they just made a horror movie like awesome yeah, go for it yeah, yeah. I, th- I think the best bits in it are the bits like that you know the the classic raimi bits uh like um was uh, was was it you, Sean, that was saying something about um, on Real Blend? You were saying about it's it's almost that it's like he knows how to perfectly direct a, a scene so that you know what's happened, but you don't actually need to see the gore of it, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me wonder what Derrickson wanted to do. You know, like how far he was planning to push it, or how much they even changed. You know, and and had the need to replace him because the I movie, mean, I will never obviously- get. He could do horror. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Matt. What were you saying? Oh, no, I was I was talking about that. I, what he was saying, I was like, the movie I will never get. That's the movie I wanted was Derrickson's yeah. sequel. Yeah. And I'll never I'll never get that. <laughs> so I'm bummed. But, um, yeah, I, I gave it a four out of five. Yeah, I think I gave it the same. That sounds right. Because it, it's getting there. But there were just there were just some niggly bits about it that that just sort of like it needed a bit of cleaning up here and there. Some bits. I don't think they worked on enough, expanded on enough. I think they sort of like went past things too much. And then some other bits, I thought they went on them for too long in some cases. Yeah, it felt more like a WandaVision movie than than the actual Doss Strange movie. And if you're going to let Wanda go full Scarlet Witch, you know, I I think she probably earns her own movie against a slew of heroes. uh, Especially when you see how quickly she gets rid of the Illuminati. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. she's pretty powerful. Yeah. But got, got to say, um, I think they did well by Anson Mount to with the Black Bolt. I think that was cracking in comparison to how he's performed him before. That sequence there, I thought that was really good. His performance in that. His death is great. It's probably yeah. my favorite death. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
but it's weird because like you were talking about this movie does all these things like that that you're watching and you're like oh this is great the the death of xavier is great yeah and then like you know a few minutes later you get oh what is this music note fight scene why is this happening it was i thought it was kind of interesting that when xavier xavier showed up they allowed them to use the x-men theme for him in it too elfman kind of cribbed from everybody which i thought was interesting instead of kind of doing his own thing did but um oh i thought sean was going to wear a spider-man t-shirt okay so in my defense i literally just did a junket interview with um the production designer for the Matt Reeves Batman. So I wore this for him and then literally <laughs> jumped from that to this. Uh, I have my little Batmobile uh, yeah. replica, which has become my fidget. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm embarrassed that I'm not wearing one of many Spider-Man shirts that I own. I, I've just changed into this from a mutant Ninja Turtles t-shirt. So there you go. There you go. Got all for all of it going on here. I mean, I mean, uh, I'm looking at what Matt's got behind him and what Sean's got behind him there. I have a, a giant, nice. like, grogu thing here. <laughs> <laughs> <Love it>. Nice. <laughs> oh, dear. And Janelle Wheeler needs to see that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a hard time keeping grogu stuff here because my, my little girl just keeps jacking it all. So, like, <laughs> I lost a pillow, a shirt. I've lost. A, there's a Batmobile sitting in her shopping cart right now. That's ironically Reeves' Batmobile. <laughs> so I've lost that too. It appears. That is a good Batmobile, though. That is really that good. That was a great Batmobile. Yeah. It is. It really is. It, it fits for it being like, year two. The, the design on that is is even yeah. really great. This sort of diecast one that they put out. So, yeah, um, yeah I'm impressed. Every, every time I see it, I keep thinking Vin Diesel must be really jealous. Hmm. Keep him away from that franchise, please. <laughs> oh, yes, please. And, and let that be not a real story that they're on about merging that with Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. I don't know, Although, man. I would, I would, I have not seen any of the Jurassic World movies. I've never sat through an entire Fast and the Furious movie. But if they made a Fast and the Furious Jurassic Park, I would be there day one for that, just to see <laughs> what the hell. <laughs> I want to see them drive cars away from dinosaurs. Let Michael yes. Bay direct that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Vin could play Bane? It's not that bad. Mm. I I I've kind of paid that before. That. Yeah. If he <laughs> plays Tom King's Bane, I'd be I'd be down for that. I can probably yeah. I can roll with that. Yeah, 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 yeah I yeah. love that Bane. Yeah, I can see that. Bane starts talking about family. You know, it all it all works out. <laughs> <You're just laughs> <Corona>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think we better do the proper introduction to this, I suppose. Was that okay, Sean? Oh, that's terrific. Sure. <laughs> yeah, don't use me as the barometer. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was trying to get some, some information out for the book as well to get people interested in that. Oh, cause... yeah. No, that's terrific. Yes. Plenty of, hopefully people will listen and, and check it out. Because if it's anything like the, uh, the the previous book release, the Snyder Cut, then I think it's essential reading. You you'd love that book, Stu. Oh, I'm sure. Yes, you that, would. Absolutely. That sounds right up my alley. Yeah, I definitely I I want to get into that now. Well, then I look forward to the fan base turning on me uh, and and d- calling me a villain <laughs> and ruining their lives. Well, the interesting <laughs> thing is that you got all these behind the scenes stories with the people behind the films. I mean. When when me and you were discussing about the uh, beforehand about the uh, the new Spider Man book, you, you even mentioned that you you'd actually spoken with Nicholas Hammond as well and people like this, and it's just interesting that you've got the inside scoop from these people behind the scenes. Yeah, it was really it was great that the more you added people to the to the roster of who we spoke to, um, then more people wanted to get involved. And, you know, so the early going, you got Nicholas Hammond and, and uh, Joe Zito, who was the director who they hired to do the canon version of it. And, you know, they were really happy to tell their stories. And then you start getting around to the to the films, the, the Raimi's and the, and the Mark website. And everyone's like, well, who did you get? And I was like, oh, well, I got I got Avi Arad and uh, Amy Pascal. And they were like, oh, OK, you know, now I kind of want to. And so right up until the very end, the last person who I got was Tom Rothman, who is the head of Sony. And he essentially, um, you know, gave it a blessing. And, and it means that like Sony endorses the book. And so 
it's, it's exciting. That's excellent. So, that is yeah. fantastic. Yeah, it really is. Thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Because you've gone all the way back, haven't you? I think all the way back to the. Have you gone back to the old sixties TV series as well? That was the US Canada co-production. Uh, I well, I start with Hammond essentially. Uh, okay. I, you know, I do touch on like the, the Electric Company, you know, segments that 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 they did in the '60s animated program. But really wanted to start with the, a lot of the live action stuff and talked about how tough it was to get Marvel stuff made in that day and how it was all sort of reserved for TV. Um, but even the 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 Hammond stuff, like they didn't have a consistent airing schedule. You know, like they would. Uh, you know, one in October, two in November. They never really knew when they were going to be on. It kept getting moved around the schedule. So what I found fascinating about the Hammond ones too is that they packaged two of those episodes together and shipped them overseas as movies. You know, so he would get, he gets approached still to this day by like uh, Spanish fans and Italian fans who come to him at conventions with like uh, cardboard cutouts from their theaters that they stole when they were kids. Uh, and it's him as Spider-Man. And then Quentin Tarantino, Tarantino put him in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He played um, the director who hires DiCaprio uh, to be in the Western, essentially. And um, Tarantino told Nicholas Hammond that he found a, a reel in a in a um, a British cinema, you know, that was just in their stockpile, essentially, of uh, a two episode Spider Man thing, and and Quentin stole it or bought it. I'm not quite sure how he did it, but he brought it back to Los Angeles and then screened it at his New Beverly uh, Theater with uh, the Hammond version and then the the first Raimi as like a double feature kind of thing. So he's a big fan, wow. big fan. That's brilliant. That's great. Mm -hmm. but yeah. So they uh, so they basically made those into the. Um, I'm trying to think of the names of the films now. Spider Man, and uh, was there something about the Dragon's Return as well, or something like that? Yeah. As one of his films, as well, yes, that is one of them. Uh, I think that was the second one. There was one that they did before it, and I forget what it was called, but yeah, those that's essentially what they did package those together. Have you had any of those on your show yet, Rob? I have not. I don't know. Uh, are they streaming anywhere? Are they even on YouTube or something? I could add I, them to the list. Trust me, I if I, I know they're they available, are. okay, I think they are on YouTube actually, to be honest with you. All right. Yeah, I'm going to add those to the list. I think the list is at like 114 right now that people can, <laughs> they just give me three numbers and I'm like, here's the movies you choose. And sometimes people are happy and sometimes people are very not. <laughs> doing a quick there. search. Yeah, I'm doing a quick search. Yeah, the pilot movie is there. It's an hour and okay. 31 minutes. And then the amazing Spider-Man, the Chinese web uh, is also available. So yeah, you can. Oh, great. Yeah, because I know the. I know the nineties generation X movie is on there. So I know that is on my list. No one's pulled it, but it's available. So I was like, all right, that's definitely, it has Jubilee in it. I want to watch it. There you go. Oh, <laughs> does that mean that you've looked at the, uh, the, uh, the version of fantastic four as well? You know what? No, I haven't even added that yet either. I, that's another thing I need to look up and see. I, I know I have friends who've watched that recently, so because I need to ask YouTube. them where they saw it. And okay. Yeah. I should YouTube. add that too. I have a VHS copy of that behind me. Nice. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go. Thank you Thank guys. You very much. Appreciate Thank it. Martin. Thank you, Thanks for having me on. Nice meeting Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great talking to you, Sean. Take care, cool. Sean. Take care. I'm actually going to run and get some dinner myself. So how, how was that guys? Were you okay with that? Rob? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. yeah that was yep. pretty good. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And Thanks take care, Marv. Me and you, Rob. Next time I'm, um, I'll let you know when I'm off for a period and then we'll sort out my, thing yeah. if we can remember what three titles they were ah, we can't. can just start over from the beginning i don't remember either we'll just no. give you three new numbers and go from there okay take care thanks guys take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.